All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we will be starting our session shortly. It's about 11.16 a.m. and we have at present nine participants. So let's wait for a few more minutes before we start this session webinar. Uh, and at the same time, uh, quick, a quick reminder to all of you to kindly keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the talk. And uh, also please remember that a Q&A session will be held at the end of the session. So you can feel free to type your questions in the chat window uh, and we will be picking them up later on. At the same time, you can also switch on your captions uh, in case the audio zones, zones out. The captions will help you uh, keep track of what is being spoken uh, during this webinar. So we'll just wait for a few more minutes uh, before we start the session off. We now have about nine participants. Uh, all right, it's 11.20 uh, a.m. and uh, I think uh, we will begin the session now uh, as we wait for more people to join in. I uh, assume that they will join in. I think the MA students are finishing up their classes and they should be here at, at any minute. But we will honor time and we will start as per our schedule. So to begin with, let me introduce myself. I'm Anjan Behra, the Assistant Dean. Uh, of the college and uh, this you are welcome to the dot talk session being organized 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 today uh, this is a session uh, which uh, aims at uh, bringing intellectuals thinkers from different walks of life and helping them interact with our college students faculty uh, staff and also individuals who are in the state in the state uh, in our state in Nagaland and beyond uh, and Today we have a very interesting topic uh, that we uh, wish to discuss on and ponder on, okay, legal implications of COVID-19. Uh, basically uh, what has happened is with the uh, commencement of the lockdown and the commencement of uh, this uh, whole uh, period of uncertainty that India and the world has been uh, be, has been pushed towards, it, become, it has become un, 
unpredictable. Life has become unpredictable uh, as we try to make sense of things that are going on. Now, amidst this pandemonium of great confusion uh, lies a, a constant, and the constant is the law. The law binds the country together. The law keeps the systems running in place, and the law ensures that everything is running right. But at times like this, it's also left very ambiguous. Law is left ambiguous as to the extent to which the law applies and what uh, what of these of the you know uh, fundamental rights that were earlier in place for the citizens are now are they still in place? Do we still have those rights or not? And apart from that, a lot of other issues also come into play. For example, the public, the way in which the public has been taking the law into their own hands. Uh, some argue that it is for the greater good of the society. Yet others argue that by taking the law into their own hands, they are breaking the law. And what is most interesting is that, as far as my knowledge goes, that the terms of the lockdown and curfew, what laws are available, what uh, this, this restrictions are in place during these times are not clearly mentioned in the constitution either. So we are at the midst of a time where law is being created and shaped uh, as we speak because lockdown is not something that is defined by the constitution as far as my reading goes. The State Disaster Management uh, Act definitely has uh, provisions for complete shutdown. However, the terms are not clearly defined in black and white. And today, addressing those issues, we have Dr. Uh, okay, Dr. Anuruddha, Anuruddha Babar from the Department of Political Science, okay, that's so college. And uh, he is someone who is always enthusiastic about organizing such talks and sharing his views and ideas with the world. He is a non-practicing, a non-practicing, uh, practicing lawyer, uh, who has, who is the founder member of the People's Law Center at, at Mumbai, and he is a researcher as well, independently working towards various kinds of studies. Uh, at the same time, he defines uh, himself as a poet by heart, a philosopher by nature, and an adventurer by soul. Uh, his Areas of interest include constitutional law, tribal studies, Southeast Asian, Asian studies, applied politics, gender studies, peace and conflict studies, and most importantly, human rights. Uh, and so today, uh, and so he is going to be going going to be speaking to us and sharing his ideas on this topic, the legal implications of COVID nineteen. So without taking much time. I now I now I now hand over the time to our guest speaker. Others, uh, please note uh, in the interest of keeping down the background noise, kindly keep your microphones on mute. Uh, you can use the chat window to type your questions, which will be picked up in the Q and A session uh, at the end of this talk. So I now I now hand over the time to our guest speaker, okay, Dr. Anirudha Babar. Please take over your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Good morning, all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Most, most important uh, thing at the outset, I would like to share my sincere gratitude for allowing me this platform to share my thoughts and ideas. Uh, world is changing. We are undergoing a strange kind of transformation. Our lifestyle had changed. The way we perceived reality has also changed. COVID-19 has changed our perspective towards the nature, towards our life, and towards our entire world. This has been a much awaited opportunity for me because uh, I have been observing even in the media uh, that, uh, you know, the legal implications of COVID-19 has not much been talked about because uh, as uh, Mr. Dean has rightly mentioned that our entire life has been governed by law. The moment you are born till your last breath, everything is governed by the law. 
everything is governed by the system. Now, what laws are applicable to this new life of lockdown? Whether are we following those laws? What is the root of those laws? And the most important thing that whether are we aware about this system which is which is which is uh, somehow influencing our life on day to day basis during this lockdown i am allotted uh, 20 odd minutes and uh, i will try my level best to share my thoughts share my ideas with all of you questions are always welcome Okay, so as we all are aware that uh, Corona virus disease 2019 is an infectious disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, that is coronavirus 2, which is also scientifically known as SARA SARS CoV 2. This disease has been first identified in uh, December 2009 in uh, uh, one of the provinces of China uh, called Wuhan. Uh, which is uh, also a capital of uh, China's Hubei, Hubei region. At present, more than 3 million people have been infected worldwide, around, uh, two mil uh, around 197,000 people uh, you know, have died. Uh, this is what uh, the official record says. And uh, if you take a record of India, Right, somewhat we are able to manage, but still we have more than 24,000 infections and uh, close to 850 deaths at this point of time. Uh, so this, this helps us to understand, this bird's eye view uh, is helps us to understand the trajectory uh, of this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, the question is, uh, uh, what strategies uh, has been implemented all over the world uh, and also including india uh, to tackle this uh, covid-19 pandemic let me let me first uh, clear one thing that since last 100 years we have never experienced this type of disease before of course there were diseases there were epidemics swine flu we have seen you know different types of sars we have seen and uh, we have also seen uh, the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome. Uh, we have seen Ebola. But if you take a statistical, uh, a statistical record of the impact of those diseases all over the world, then you will find that the impact was contained in specific geopolitical pockets, right? That was not, in short, that was not an international emergency if you compare uh, with the impact of this COVID-19. COVID-19 is an international emergency. See, Ebola had no direct impact uh, on Asian countries. Ebola never had any direct impact on, uh, you know, on the, uh, the European countries. Even the Middle Eastern, uh, you know, uh, respiratory syndrome did not have any impact uh, in Indian subcontinent. So containment was there uh, and containment was possible while tackling those types of diseases, right? But when it comes to COVID-19, the major feature of COVID-19 is it's an international emergency. And uh, to tackle this international emergency, which has created havoc all over the world, uh, different countries have developed different strategies. But let me tell you, uh, there is no much difference uh, among those strategies because one country, it seems one country is learning from another country. So basically, how to tackle with this uh, epidemic, how to tackle with this international emergency is not something that we are, uh, we are developing on our own, but it is something that we are learning from each other, right? So uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, a couple of strategic responses, uh, you know, are uh, available at our disposal. Uh, but but before moving to them, let us first understand, you know, uh, the gravity of the pandemic. Okay, millions of people uh, have been infected, thousands of people have been died. The entire world got into lockdown, and most importantly, my dear friends, there is no vaccine available as of now. 
there are there are many uh, news cropping up that one country is developing this vaccine that vaccine you know some countries are advancing towards uh, you know uh, animal trials uh, trials on human beings so on and so forth but at this point of time as of now 28th april 2020 we do not have any 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 vaccine at our disposal right so that makes this threat uh, a very serious uh, this threat very grave now in the absence of vaccine what other uh, responses uh, can we leveled against um, the threat of covid-19 let me first tell you uh, all over the world i mean all uh, you know the administration as well as the medical experts have unanimously agreed that social distancing or say physical distancing has been considered as one of the robust response robust strategic response okay to control the spread of uh, covid-19 then uh, you know the uh, total lockdown uh, has also been implemented all over the world what is the meaning of total lockdown right uh, your shops will be closed your your economic affairs will be closed your day to day affairs will be closed you know uh, uh, basically uh, the the complete system the economic system the social system will be in a complete lockdown then another response uh, which is also very important which has been leveled against covid-19 is emphasis on personal hygiene you know uh, how to wash your hands you should not touch your eyes you should not touch your nose you know you have to maintain 3 feet of distance uh, you know uh, while talking with a person you have to wear masks you know uh, you have to uh, take care of your eyes so on and so forth uh now another question comes is uh, you know what what is the another important uh, you know feature of the strategic responses the other feature of strategic responses is active policing now it sounds very odd right because i was talking about the medical terms like you know uh, personal hygiene you know this act but suddenly you know this word active policing comes now let me tell you one thing very clearly right this kind of world that we are trapped in at this point of time or rather dragged in this kind of situation right we are not used to it so my observation is that people do not know what is to be done i mean let me because i have been following uh, the trajectory of this disease since last december right when it was in china china uh, was not willing to share complete information so we were in we were in dark at this point of time but but still whatever information was leaking out from wuhan okay made us believe that something unparalleled uh, you know uh, which have which we have never experienced before in our lifetime is happening in china and then finally this turned out to be true now because of this we we are still in confusion that how to behave how not to behave right so some guidelines have been issued and it has been seen that those guidelines those regulation those rules which i am talking about during the course of my talk they are not uh, actually you know uh, being understood by the people right i mean this is my this is my conclusion right i mean if you want to take a bird's eye view right and if you want to understand that in what way uh, uh, the people are complying with uh, the latest rules and regulations and the laws then you will find that many people are not able to comply because they either ignore the rules and regulations or they might not be aware of those rules and regulations we are going to talk about them in detail right so active policing is also a uh, important feature uh, or another important strategic response uh, you know that india has also leveled and also the other world, uh, other countries have also leveled then uh, invocation of special laws we have uh, we have invoke you know special kind of laws right have you ever heard before epidemic disease act no never uh, i i was a lawyer before becoming uh, you know a professor of political science i was a lawyer and i i personally let me tell you i never heard this law before you know the epidemic disease act it is a colonial legislation right we are using that rather we are compelled to use this colonial legislation at this point of time okay 
So you can understand, uh, you know, the complexity and uh, the gravity of uh, uh, this uh, pandemic. Now, uh, let us understand uh, the case of India. Okay. Uh, I would like to discuss some challenges uh, to implement uh, those strategic, strategic responses that, that I have given you in a nutshell, you know, just a moment back, right? So uh, let us first understand what is the first uh, challenge that, uh, you know, the India is facing. The first challenge is a social distancing and lockdown and its public response. See, the idea of social distancing and lockdown is completely new uh, in the context of India. See, it is it is said that that Indians are argumentative people. Indian love to be with each other all the time. So basically, our social ties are very close, right? So the idea about social distancing, idea about uh, lockdown, idea about you know uh, living in the solitude, uh, you know doing nothing, it's is actually culturally very strange. Uh, to India, right? So it is very, uh, it is very interesting to actually understand that how uh, uh, it, uh, how Indians actually responded to social distancing in the earlier days of uh, lockdown uh, or lockdown policy. You may, you may call it right. So in this case, you will be surprised to know that many people got confused. Uh, you can just, uh, for references, you can go through. Uh, uh, the news headlines you can go through different newspapers uh, and then you will conclude you will also conclude that nobody knows what's happening you know the gravity of the situation was not was not actually comprehended by a common indian public but uh, as the statistics uh, started coming up as information started coming up the second uh, uh, the second uh, you know uh, thing that we have witnessed is panicking okay the first is ignorance the second is panicking so people started getting panic okay now what happened is that due to this panicking again uh, people were not able to understand uh, what is their duty in this unique scenario moreover we have also witnessed carelessness of people we have also witnessed that how people were, uh, you know, started roaming on the empty streets. Basically, what the medical experts uh, have been trying to say is that social distancing takes the end of spreading of virus. And uh, unfortunately, at the initial stage, I believe many people were not able to understand, you know, this, uh, this this entire term of breaking the chain or breaking the cycle of the virus. And collectively, because of uh, uh, the problems that uh, you know the people's ignorance have created or people's carelessness have created, you know, uh, that collective problems have uh, imposed, uh, you know. A serious challenge upon police administration, you know, and uh, we have to accept that. We have to accept that, you know, what happened uh, at Markas or what happened in different parts of India. I mean, uh, since I have very less time in my hand, I need not go into the detail. But what does it show? What does it show? Either it shows ignorance. Point number one. Either it shows complete disregard for the law of the land, number two, and number three, either it disregard complete carelessness. Now, this is the problem. And uh, in this situation, the entire police administration had to function. But uh, what's the result? On one hand, uh, it was very difficult to uh, you know the content people uh, then on the other hand uh, it was very difficult to uh, uh, you know control uh, the infection graph uh, then as a result what happened you know the infection graph uh, kept on rising i mean the statistics is available widely on internet if you just google it out you will come to know uh, now another question that uh, I mean, this talk is all about is the legal implications of COVID-19, right? I mean, so far I have given you a little bit idea about 
uh, about uh, you know the strategic responses the challenges that uh, you know uh, the, the the police administration have faced so far right now let us talk about the technical aspect of it okay uh, now see there are certain sections which has been invoked uh, during this uh, covid 19 uh, pandemic right uh, i'll just introduce you to uh, those uh, sections uh, i have uh, let us start from uh, indian penal code uh, i'm i am carrying my uh, bear act with me so for your information let us start with uh, section 88 of uh, indian penal code right so what does section 88 of indian penal code talks about it talks about disobedience to order duly promulgated by the public servant right what does it say disobedience to order uh, duly promulgated by the public servant now what does it mean see any order which is being issued by any public servant right I'm not going to give you a definition of public servant, but public uh, servant uh, includes uh, civil civil service officers as well as uh, you know any person who who is uh, attached to perform public duties, right? So those orders which has been issued by uh, any public servant and those order are being uh, you know not followed properly, right? In letter and spirit, then there is a punishment involved in that. Punishment is one month of imprisonment or or fine and if the gravity of the offense increases then the then the punishment of imprisonment can increase up to six months also now why i have pinpointed this particular section because let me tell you in this entire chaos this section has been invoked right because uh, this particular section provides immunity to the civil servant uh, civil servants as well as the uh, police officers okay uh, like, for example, at local level, certain regulations and certain rules uh, are also being uh, uh, are also being, you know, uh, promulgated. Right. Certain orders have been promulgated. And if a common man is not following them, right, either it is being promulgated by executive magistrate or it is promulgated by, you know, a district magistrate, you know, then that is amount to disobedience. Right. And uh, if you if a person is uh, accused of disobedience and if subsequently, uh, you know, uh, he's convicted, then one month imprisonment uh, or if uh, the disobedience uh, is grave in nature, then six months of imprisonment, uh, you know, is provided in Section 188 of uh, IPC. The second section, which is uh, com which has been seen commonly, uh, you know, invoking in this uh, COVID-19 scenario in India is that uh, that is section 200 and uh, section 269. Now, uh, this is section 269. Now, now listen to me very carefully. What does this section tells us? It tells us negligent act likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life. And let me tell you, number of FIRs in Bombay, number of FIRs in Gujarat have been filed under Section 269, right? In uh, especially in case of uh, the the Marcus case, right? Which which uh, because of that, we, you know, the hotspot has been created. Okay, in uh, Nizamuddin area of Delhi, right? People have been charged, you know, under Section 269. Okay, now. What is section 269 talks about? Negligent act likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life. Okay. Subsequently, section 270 has also been invoked. Section 270 speaks about malignant act likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life. Okay. Now see the gravity of the offenses under section 269 and, and under 270 is different. Under Section 269, for uh, for negligent act under Section 269, you know the punishment would be six months and fine. And under Section 270, any malignant act likely to spread infection, a punishment would be imprisonment of two years. Okay. Now please understand. Along with this, there is Section 271 also. Uh, I think Section 271 of IPC has not been promulgated as such, but still for, for the information of viewers, uh, let me share with you. Section 271 provides that 
disobedience of quarantine rule is subject to six months imprisonment or a fine. But let us not get confused. Section 271 is only applicable to the vessels. I'm especially I'm talking about sea vessels. What does it say? Section 271 talks about disobedience to quarantine rule. Whoever knowingly disobeys any rule made and promulgated by the government for putting any vessel into a state of quarantine or for regulating the intercourse of vessel in a state of quarantine with the shore or with other vessel or for regulating the intercourse between places where an infectious disease prevails and other places shall be punished with the imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine. It simply talks about quarantine in the vessel, especially it talks about the sea vessel. Uh, let me tell you the background of this section. Uh, can, can somebody recall that what happened exactly 100 years ago? A similar kind of situation occurred, but the disease was different. What type of disease was that? That was Spanish flu, uh, Spanish fever or Spanish flu or something like that. Okay. And if you take this Indian Penal Code, this Indian Penal Code uh, uh, was uh, drafted in 1860. Okay, so this 271, what, hap what happened, uh, uh, you know, in Spanish flu is that many uh, people were quarantined on the sea vessels, right? I mean, they were, they were mostly sailors. They were not allowed to uh, get down on the shores. And those who tried to, you know, break the quarantine rule, they were subject to six months of imprisonment or fine. Okay, so this was the law that was promulgated, you know, 100 years ago at that point of time right now simultaneously this is this is what i have spoken about indian penal code right section 80 section 188 section 269 section 270 and section 271 let us move also now let us move to criminal procedure code now what does the criminal procedure code has to say see we all heard about section 144 curfew many people who are not uh, you know well words with the law they are also you know uh, now very familiar with uh, section 144 exo chavalis they talk uh, as they say in hindi see basically 144 talks about curfew orders okay now curfew can be promulgated by executive magistrate and, or maybe district magistrate at any point of time now what powers uh, does the executive magistrate commissionerate or district magistrate enjoy under section 144 is that any person can be arrested who is jumping curfew orders or who is flouting curfew orders right and uh, let me just uh, uh, draw your attention to certain situations wherein this has happened uh, in reference to latest uh, covid-19 situation can you believe it more than 600 people have been arrested more than 600 fir's have been filed under section uh, 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 144 of crpc uh, i mean it is beyond my understanding and uh, if i if i take a defense that oh my god sir i have not uh, i was not aware about uh, this curfew order i was not aware about section 144 i was not aware about my own responsibility under section 144 then let me tell you law has given certain defenses uh, certain valid defenses uh, to accuse right ignorance is not a defense ignorance is not a legal defense i mean if i am accused and if i go to the court and if i say that i'm sorry my lord i was not aware about the law then 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 the judge will definitely tell you that my dear this ignorance is not a valid defense in the eyes of law you know so it is a duty of every citizen of india to familiarize himself or herself about every rule, every regulation, every law, every ordinance which is prevalent in the state. That is very important. So I really want to, you know, talk about uh, Section 144 of CRPC. You know, many FIRs have been filed. Moreover, Section 100. Uh, Doctor Dr. Anutha, if I may quickly interrupt, in the interest of time, I would request you to wind the session in about in about four to five minutes, so we can yeah, move sure, on sure, to sure. questions. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I will do that. I will do that. Okay. So uh, after 144, we move to section 133 that talks about conditional order for removal of nuisance by district magistrate. Right. So 
133 uh, has also been promulgated, right? But unfortunately, what we have seen is uh, uh, people have flouted that also. Then, uh, as uh, I was requested to, you know, to wrap up my session within a few minutes, I'll just uh, give you a bird's eye view. Then we have uh, Epidemic Disease Act. So Section 2, Section 3, and Section 4 of Epidemic Disease Act has been promulgated. Then uh, we we move to uh, you know the Disaster Management Act under Section Five of Disaster Management Act. Central government have declared this COVID nineteen as a national uh, uh, this uh, national disaster. Uh, you know then we have also moved to a couple of more acts. That is Essential Service Management Act. Right? Have you heard about it? The medical services comes under Essential Services Management Act. Then have you heard about the Essential uh, Goods Management Act? right the masks and all essential commodities i apologize it is essential commodities management act okay so your marks and medical equipments are all listed under essential commodities management act then uh, we move to constitution article 47 of the constitution says that the state has a paramount duty for nutrition security and the standard of living and improvement of public health i mean that uh, covers everything you know uh, why, why, why state is doing what it's supposed to do? Why lockdown? Uh, why, uh, you know, uh, the medical staff is working 24 hours? You know, everything is covered under Article 47. That that says that that a state has a paramount duty for nutrition, security, and the standard of living and improving of public health. Then entry 29 of the concurrent list under the constitution empowers the central as well as state governments to legislate on the matters pertaining to the prevention of infection or contagious diseases, right? So please understand that in Nagaland, we have, uh, you know, our own, uh, uh, you know, uh, the act which has been promulgated by the state of Nagaland to tackle the menace of uh, COVID-19 right which is a result of uh, entry 29 and then entries one and six of state list talks about uh, the governments are empowered to deal with the matters related to public health and public order so this is the legal genesis of the acts which are prevalent at this point of time okay now another question let me just quickly uh, uh, you know take your attention is to the privacy under K. Puttuswami versus Union of India, it is clearly mentioned in the Supreme Court, take down the case, K. Puttuswami versus Union of India, the release of personal data has become a privacy concern and has been stated as a gross violation of the legitimate ex ex expectation of privacy. We have seen that people who have been infected or uh, those who have been uh, suspicious to be infected with COVID-19, their names have been released, their photographs have been released. Those people have been discriminated in the eyes of the people and by the people this is absolutely not acceptable in the civilized society this is not acceptable uh, in the constitutional democracy right so supreme court has uh, uh, rightly mentioned its view that the release of personal data has become a privacy concern and has been stated as a gross violation of the legitimate expectation of a privacy okay then there are some other arguments which are coming, uh, you know, about Arugya Setu app also that it tracks the movement and health details among other people that are the users of breach of personal data. So this is also raising privacy concerns. Uh, only future will tell us what is it all about. Then, you know, in Nagaland, we have Nagaland Epidemic Disease Regulations Act. As I told you, that Essential Service Management Act is very much present all over India. Essential uh, Commodities Act is very much present all over India uh, in supplement with uh, uh, relevant uh, regulations under uh, Indian Penal Code and uh, CRPC and Disaster Management Act. Now coming to the conclusion, see, extraordinary measures are necessary to tackle extraordinary circumstances and the entire world uh, is witnessing that, you know. But my, my humble submission is that let us allow ourselves to familiarize with the laws. Law of land must be respected. We are a part of a very different situation now, right? So it is not just a duty of the medical professional to protect us from the disease. It is also a duty of ourselves, right? Our duty to fight COVID-19 and also our duty to follow the rules and regulations promulgated from time to time by the state government, by the central government, you know. And let me reiterate once again that ignorance of law is neither an excuse nor a legal defense. 
it will never help you in case you are caught by the uh, or you are caught in the uh, you know hands of the law enforcement uh, agencies let us obey the laws let us fight covid 19 the time has come to unite and fight covid 19 thank you thank you for this opportunity thank you so much thank you so much dr dr nirudha it was an infor it was an informative session it was so good to actually uh, learn about the various articles and uh, various you know prospects that are that are that the you know indian law has has for us and what is important that i realized during your talk is that at moments like this we citizens should actually have a first hand information of the law then depend on the news channels and other sources to tell us what the law is i mean that is our, that we should be aware of our rights because i mean we know right now news channels are primary sources of information to what extent can we actually trust them and so at this juncture it actually becomes very important to be familiar uh, with these with these particular articles okay provisions that the law uh, has for us so thank you so much for giving us all those you know all those you know, information uh, and so sorry we had to cut you short uh, but that is only in the interest of time so i leave the session open now for any questions uh, that can be asked i think since there's only nine of us uh, what i will kind of you know uh, maybe ask our our audiences uh, is uh, if you have questions please switch on your microphone and ask the question question directly uh, since there is just a few of us i think we can just use that otherwise if you do not have a proper uh, sound connection you can always use the chat window to type in your question but otherwise uh, let's use use the use a microphone and speak to you know speak to each other directly uh, for this q and a session so i give the time now for any questions that the audience might have. Okay, hi, I have a question, okay. Um, Anirudha, thanks so much for the session. I think this was um, needed and it's very helpful, you know, for everyone who's attending. I wish more could have attended, but I think um, this time, even though we have nine of us here, I'm sure it's educated a lot of us, all of us here. Um, so one thing that I, uh, liked what you about what you said was that you know you mentioned that ignorance is just not an excuse you know for not being aware of the law or for not you know uh, even being aware of your rights ignorance is not an excuse and I think students really need to know that you know so that was um, th that that was I, I, that's and that's an important point simple basic but an important point I felt and then what I uh, wanted to ask basically was about um, what is your uh, opinion on this case where in Dimapur we had Raja Jain who was right co uh, COVID positive and um, we we say that we every uh, patient has a basic right of their you know identity not being revealed um, of their case history address but then we saw that names were splashed out right identities were revealed addresses phone numbers and in the case of raja jane i think the government itself decided that it was they mentioned right if you if you saw the notification that it was necessary for his identity to be revealed in order to prevent the spread of the virus and um so what what about instances like that you know, um, and that's my first question. The second one is with regard to the Shillong case. We had a family, a doctor who had expired because of the COVID-19 case and his family was under quarantine in their house, whereas the government had made provisions for a quarantine facility that all affected members would have to go to the quarantine facility. And um, quarantine there and be institutionalized. But in this case, the family I heard was not taken to the quarantine facility because Conrad Sangma has, Conrad has mentioned that um, he's giving time to the family, you know, because of the demise of the father. And um, so they were not taken to the quarantine facility. So my question here is like, if families would like to quarantine on their own, in their own respective homes, you know, uh, as opposed to the law or as opposed to the notification, the rule that's been given by the by the state government to, you know, be institutionalized. Um, 
what what would wouldn't that can is that an option um can we call that as a basic human right to want to be you know to to to, to recuperate at home rather than an institutional quarantine Is Dr. Dr. Nuta, you can respond. Thank you, Dr. Nevasa. Thank you for your question. See, these are certain basic uh, questions that needs to be answered. Let us start with uh, a case of uh, Raja Jain. OK. We all know what happened to Raja Jain, how he uh, uh, reached to Guwahati and uh, uh, what's, what's the present uh, status of this case. However, the most important thing is the identity revelation, right? Supreme Court uh, has uh, clearly stated that about, with reference to right to privacy that the identity should not be released. And the, on the contrary, the state government, uh, by virtue of its uh, notification, has uh, clearly uh, stated that the identity revelation is necessary, uh, you know, to to, sp to stop spreading disease or to let the people know that who is he, right? Let me tell you one more interesting thing. This uh, Arugya app, okay, I was talking about that. This Arugya app has also raised certain uh, certain questions regarding uh, the privacy, right? Like, for example, your movements are recorded, uh, you know, uh, your health status is recorded, where are you going, whom are you meeting? So basically, what my understanding is that in this case, uh, in reference to specific situations, I call it a situational response. Right. Now, on one hand, Supreme Court has clearly mentioned that your privacy is your is your right. OK, it has not been stated as a fundamental right, but it is your right and uh, your right is required to be protected by the state law. OK, in all the circumstances. But dear friends, what I understand is that we are dealing with extraordinary circumstances. See, let me tell you, Raja Jain has its one case. OK. But there were a um, few more cases also which came up. Like, for example, one case of one girl came up, right? And uh, thousands of rumors started spreading, uh, you know, about uh, the, the the COVID status of that girl. Okay, it uh, it happened. Uh, I mean, I know I'm, I'm familiar with this case. Then about uh, then one old man uh, who visited uh, maybe some I don't know which some religious place. He came back. I think Markazwala. That Markazwala came to Burma camp, and uh, you know his pictures and all the information started to be circulated, and police started taking an action. And you know, don't you think that it's a contradiction? And let me tell you why this is contradiction. Because in this case, you know, the government in Raja's case, government has decided to reveal his identity in the interest of public welfare, right? Now, under what rule, under what regulation of Nagaland COVID rules this has been done, I'm not aware of it, right? We have to go into the details of Nagaland COVID rules 2020. Uh, there is one uh, regulation which is, uh, which is in function at this point of time in Nagaland, right? So we have to see whether that provision is there in the rules or not. If it is not there, then definitely Rajat's family, you know, can uh, take a uh, take state to to concern high court, you know, and file uh, you know writ petition against the ag action of the state. Okay, because Supreme Court has already uh, settled the position. But now here I'm just talking uh, in terms of ifs and buts. Okay, because we are dealing with extraordinary circumstances. But as for the notification, they have clearly mentioned that uh, you know in the inter in, in the public interest or to spread the uh, uh, to stop the spreading of the virus and this and that right they have taken this decision now the validity of the decision of the government has to be decided by the concern court right and that validity of the decision will be decided if raja's family decides to move against the move of the state and challenge it before the uh, uh, you know, either High Court or before the Supreme Court, because for me, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm completely uh, in a position to say that it's a violation of individual right. If suppose if the state is like, for example, what happened in HIV cases, right? 
there is a privacy clause okay uh, and the supreme court has also declared that uh, no hiv cases will ever be revealed but still rumors are spreading about the people who are being infected about hiv or who may not be infected with hiv this is unfortunately what exactly is happening with the covid 19 social discrimination is everywhere so if that is the case then who gave government right to declare his name I, I actually I was so surprised when this came in the news. Right, that was not necessary. We have other ways to protect uh, what government talks about. Uh, you know, the spreading of the coronavirus. We should not take one person responsible for for you know the spreading of the outbreak and this and that. So what my understanding is that if we want to test the validity of the notification, number one, we have to go to. Uh, we have to go through the uh, the current uh, COVID-19 rules, uh, you know, given by uh, this uh, Nagaland State Assembly, right? And second, uh, it depends on the family and uh, Mr. Raja himself if he wants to challenge uh, what has government done, and if he's not uh, happy or if he thinks that his right is violated, he can move to High Court and Supreme Court. And definitely, th th there is a case. I mean, I'm, I'm very open about that. Even I was so surprised. Any lawyer will be surprised, okay, uh, after reading that notification. Now, when it comes to uh, this uh, question number two, okay, that talks about quarantine, right? Okay, so can we can we quarantine ourselves in the house? Okay, let me tell you once again. Uh, there are some cases, okay wherein people have tried to quarantine themselves in the house okay but they were not allowed like what happened in maharashtra uh, one you know one family okay uh, they were they, they were willing to you know quarantine themselves in the house but uh, state government uh, did not allow them now the question is can exception be made my question the question is can exception be made now see exception we cannot make it is law or the policy maker has to make an exception. So therefore, I am, yeah, Sir Kulo, one second. Uh, yes, yes, OK. So the question is, uh, logically, we can say that, yes, I am capable to take care of myself. And uh, yes, uh, um, Sir Kulo, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm just concluding the second answer. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So basically, it depends on the government, not depends on us. Yeah. Okay. So whether okay. to quarantine ourselves or whether not to quarantine ourselves, are they in no, quarantine? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Second question. Uh, Kulu, you can uh, go ahead with your question, sir. Kulu. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Anirudha. Thanks, uh, Anjan. Um, see. Uh, Anira, just just uh, one heads up because we have lack of time. We're probably going to need the answers a bit short. Um, so I just want to know, based on your experience uh, or whatever you're aware of, has there been a precedent for? Uh, is there a case where somebody has sued their govern sued the government for disobeying its own order? Are you aware of any? Yeah, there are many. Yes, 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 yes. There are many cases. There are many cases. Okay, Government I has up with this question. There are cases. Yes, yes. There, there are cases. What did they get? What did they sue the governments for? Was it money? Was it reinstatement? What 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 were the damages? Are you aware of any? I just want to yes or no. A couple of cases are there. A couple of cases are there. Okay. If a government servant, there is a government rule in existence. And government servant acting in contradiction, uh, in in contradiction with the rule in, uh, you know, substance. Okay, uh, rule in prevalence. Then definitely the action has been taken. And uh, if the party has initiated, then the damages has been asked. Definitely. Like for example, especially in case of Rajas. Okay, when the privacy of the person is at stake, right? And the notification which has been issued. Uh, what is the legal standing of notification is still a big question. The, what is the constitutional standing of the notification? Anira, it's still a big question. What, whether they were yes, awarded it's... anything. Were they awarded cash or how did they compensate? See, the damage. Or, I mean, to add to it, has the case been resolved right. as such or 
is there no resolution till date? No, no, no. It, the cases has been resolved. Cases has been resolved. Whenever the instances happen, when government servants, government officers, they are contravening their own orders, contravening their own directions, okay, then the cases can be moved against them, okay, uh, with relevant writ petitions. And yes, the damages have been awarded, the reliefs have been awarded, okay. So if, if if suppose there's a personal loss because of the actions of the government servant, the personal loss has occurred to whom, right? Then uh, to uh, to tackle that, I can ask for damages. That is very much possible, and there are so many precedents uh, available. I mean, I do, I'm not able to recall the cases, but yes, there are case laws. Why not? Okay, fine. If you, uh, I just wanted to know whether you were able to recall any. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. No. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Anirudha. Uh, I think for since we are running short of time, uh, we will not take any more questions right now. But I am going to post Dr. Anirudha's email ID. Uh, we can continue the discussion with him over email uh, after this session is done as well. I myself had a question which I wanted to ask, but yes, I'll carry it over with him in person. So thank you so much, everyone, for having joined us. Uh, for this session. It has been quite helpful for all of us. And uh, thank you so much for all of you. And uh, I wish you uh, to stay safe. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. So thank with you. this end our session here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.